Hi there, Adam Gower here, and in today's special Life in the Day of COVID-19 podcast episode, you're going to hear from Gregory Friedman, who is co-founder at BH3. BH3 stands for, right, three key principles, and we're going to be focused specifically on the third of those three key investment disciplines, non-performing debt. Ooh, my favorite topic. Simple fact, as you know, is that real estate comes in cycles. It doesn't matter what causes it to go down. Economic recession lacks banking regulations, irrational exuberance, or COVID-19. The fact is that real estate always goes down in value at some point, and we see prices adjusting to a new normal where the assumptions put in place during the good times are eviscerated and the weaker players and their investors get wiped out. Although people like to use the term distressed real estate, it is really a misnomer. There's nothing wrong with the real estate. It's the capital stack that sits on top of it that's distressed. But without somebody coming in to recapitalize the debt, the real estate and all its occupiers could indeed become distressed if the building falls into disrepair, when the current owners run out of money, or motivation to persevere and to maintain the property properly. Gregory Friedman, my guest, is one of those guys who understands how distressed debt works and how to fix it. Buying non-performing loans is a highly skilled and technical business. I personally transacted over a billion dollars of them during the last downturn. It requires a sophisticated approach to real estate investing and done properly can uncover extraordinary value for investors. But you need to know what you're doing and Gregory is one of those guys who does. So what you're going to hear about today is how to make money in a downturn, what to look for and who to back. Now, as you know, I don't give investment advice recommendations or even suggest that you invest in real estate at all. If you'd like to stay close to the basket, however, of opportunities as they come across my desk, go to gowercrowd.com and be sure to sign up. Frankly, sign up for anything, right? anything at all on my website. And you'll get on my email list for advanced notices of anything that I see. There's a ton of free training on the website from the whiteboard workshop where you can learn how to raise money online to the investor acquisition system that we're running a discounted special on at the moment to free investor education newsletter. Plus, we have a special COVID-19 resource section. So be sure to check that out. It's all there at gowcrowd.com. Sign up, get your name on my email list, and I will let you know when I start to see deals. All right, so let's get on with it. Let's find out what distressed debt is, how it comes about, and how to make money from it over the next few months with Gregory Friedman, co-founder at BH3. Gregory Thank you so very much for being on my podcast today, actually to talk about my personal favorite subject. I hate to say this, but it is. Uh, so I'm going to read to you the headline of the Globe Street article that prompted me to get okay. you on the show. And then I'm going to ask you my first question. This time, the article said the distress buying opportunities will be different. So, two questions, because that headline assumes a couple things. One, everybody knows what distress buying opportunities means. And two, by implication, that it's going to be different, that it's going to be different from when. So, let's start with, if you don't mind, tell me first, what is distress? And then tell me, what last time were we talking about? And I know both of us know that already, but, <clears throat> and how will it be different? You're on. Sure. So first, first and foremost, thanks. Thanks again for having me. You get a lot of pleasure out of doing uh, these calls with peers in the industry and, you know, getting to, to pick everyone's brains on, on where they, they see the world, uh, not only today, but where it's going from here. Uh, so I, I think there's no question that, um, there's going to be distress on the back end of this. And the, the question that remains is, is how long and how deep and, and, and what's the path to recovery? Uh, so distress by its very nature 
in, in, in our world of, of, of commercial real estate is where there's a dislocation between the asset value on the ground and the actual last all loan exposure on the senior loan or the mezzanine position or the private equity position anywhere up and down the capital stack. Um, and by normal underwritings, you know, senior lender loans, you know, 65 or 70% of value. Uh, so by way of example, if they went $100 million on a $150 million asset, um, when they underwrote to get to that value when they originated the loan, uh, that asset's value today, if it's significantly less, um, impairs their loan. Uh, so if that asset today is only worth $100 million, um, their loan or their, that underlying paper is no longer worth par uh, because that loan is now at 100 cents of value. Uh, so similar to how bonds trade, um, there's there's implied discounts that are that are associated to, to taking that risk in the capital stack. Right. So everything that you're talking about actually is related to the debt that is on a property, right? So when people talk about, I remember during the last time, uh, during the last downturn, let's definitely talk about that comparison. But during the last time, people habitually talked about distressed real estate. And I never actually, as, ma as many deals as I actually did during the last downturn, never actually came across, with some minor exceptions, distressed real estate. The real estate is fine. It's right. the capital stack. Uh, that yeah, it, 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 it's, it's just resetting of basis based on new underwriting conditions, right? It's, it's hey, this is where the world was when this loan was originated. Here's where the, where the world actually is today. And based on today's new reality, what, what is the capital stack supposed to look like um, today under the new normal? Uh, to answer the, 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 the second part of your question, um, it's different compared to, to when. Uh, when we're referencing that, obviously we're using the most you know, recent uh, credit crisis in 2008, 2009. It's when uh, we actually started as a firm um, in 2009 with our very first uh, distressed deal, uh, which was a senior loan that we bought from Regions Bank here in Miami Beach on a busted condo project that was about 65% complete. Uh, and, and, and where we're spending a lot of the time talking today and strategizing today, and it goes back to our thesis when we started our distressed debt fund in the end of 2018, is how, how, how is it different? And, and to answer the how, you really got to focus on the who, right? The who that we know of in 2008, 2009, that we were buying from was your household names, your regions, banks, HSBC, Lehman Brothers, obviously, um, with their demise, um, and other regional banks of the sort. Uh, and what, what happened post that credit crisis um, was some fundamental changes, uh, primarily driven by regulation. So you had you know, Dodd-Frank and Basel III, and basically it required those household name banks to act differently in terms of, of real estate lending. Uh, and they left this void in the lending marketplace um, on transitional loans, construction loans, land loans, um, or anything that, that wasn't kind of existing, stabilized, you know, middle of the fairway type, um, type asset classes or geographies. Um, that stayed with the banks, and it was always your cheapest cost of capital was to stay with the banks. But the void that they, that they left was a big void, um, and that void was filled in mass with you know, private equity, hedge funds, um, what we call tourist lenders on that second or third tier. Um, and if you look at kind of the year over year, the market share of, of loans that were actually made, the every year had growth in the non-traditional lender space. Um, and we've been borrowers from those guys on construction projects. We've been investors with some of those guys. Um, but that void was filled. Now, an interesting tidbit there is, is that of the 400 or 500 billion dollars you know post 2010 that's filled that void 90 percent or more of that has been raised by guys that were not lenders in 2008 um, and that's really what we found fascinating in terms of identifying the who um, because a rising tide floats all ships and most of these guys have had a great run um, for the past 10 or 12 years because there's been liquidity in the market, values have risen, bars have always had the ability to kind of refinance or play musical chairs from one lender to the next. Uh, and we, we anticipated a catalyst occurring um, where the music would stop 
Um, obviously on a human level, no one wanted it to be a, a pandemic. Um, and also from a, a thesis level, no one, ourselves included, anticipated that would be kind of broad based, all asset classes, all people, um, and where everyone in the world is kind of focused on one issue at the same time. Uh, so that's how it's different this time around. Uh, it's, it's, it's the who, and our focus is really on, on buying up from, from those folks that um, aren't equipped to deal with the stress and, and the complexities of litigation and non-performing loans. Um, but even more broad based than that is how are those folks capitalized? Because what burned everyone in 2008, 2009 was the, was the credit crisis, which was really f the financial engineering that had taken place and the banks were the ones holding that risk. Well, today, that same financial engineering has occurred, just that risk piece is held by different people, meaning CMBS came back you know, very, very um, strongly. That's you know, gonna be tested in the next you know, couple of years. Um, but the repo lines, the warehouse facilities, the CLOs, the packaging of that risk was still the same. It's just either done by different people at origination um, or held by different people at the investor level, whether it's bondholders, um, institutional investors, uh, individual investors through the funds that they invested in. Um, so it's, it's, it's a different navigation. It's a different minefield this time. Um, and the, 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 the one positive from that in terms of society um, is that the banks are in generally very healthy shape. Uh, so while there's a need to prop up um, liquidity in the market um, for the, the, the conservative loans or the AAA bond pieces um, or to keep actual business flowing, that's great. I think the government's done a great job there. Um, but for the bad actors that were just doing the same thing again um, that they were doing in 2007, 2008, where they're super highly levered, there's no empathy, uh, nor should there be for, for, for those funds. Very interesting. So you're making a distinction here between, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but you're making a distinction between non-bank lenders and banks. Is that right? That have emerged over the last 10 years. And the distinction is that banks are much more healthy than they were last time, clearly. Right. Uh, but the, the non-bank lenders that have entered the market are ill-equipped. Is that right? Is that what you're looking at, basically? So, so yes. Uh, on a macro level, yes. But what it requires is looking at a micro level. And, and, and when I'm talking about banks, I'm, I'm really talking about you know, domestic banks, your, your big household names, um, included in that group of tourist lenders or new entrants into the marketplace. Uh, there's certainly some banks in there, mostly out of Asia or Europe, um, that came into the space in a big way. Um, the one big non-performing loan that we bought in, in, in 2019 was from United Overseas Bank, which is a Singapore-based bank. Um, and in that capital stack, there was uh, Chinese entities all up and down the capital stack um, outside of that senior loan. But what, what I'm really talking about on a micro level is in terms of, of there's, there's good actors. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but when the, when the government came out, um, with the TALF and kind of buying corporate paper, they came up with this concept of fallen angels, which was good companies, good companies that were downgraded just because of the pandemic for no other reason whatsoever. Um, so if you, if, you, if you took a similar philosophy and apply that on a micro level to real estate, there's, there's good borrowers, meaning, hey, they have great assets, they're good sponsors, they're good operators, um, hotel, retail, multifamily office, um, but they, there's a dislocation today purely because of the, of the pandemic and no other reason. That's, that's one bucket and the, the, path, the path to recovery for them is a very different strategy where it's, hey, the lenders are going to work with them or we're going to work with them if we, if we inherit those senior loan positions and kind of giving them the latitude and the runway to recover. Um, then there's another bucket where they were highly levered, highly structured deals to begin with um, that were probably already on the margin in 2018 or 2019 that this pandemic just kind of brought forth the reality of what was already going to be. Um, and again, just that note that we bought in 2019 was on 125 Granite Street. Um, great sponsor, but highly structured capital stack where the actual developer and sponsor of the deal probably only had about two and a half or 3% of the total equity in the deal. There was 
there is senior debt, there is subordinate debt, there is mezzanine debt, there is preferred equity, there is common equity, and then that common equity, that, that was syndicated um, to a lot of folks as well. So, so in those highly structured deals where in a rising tide environment, those guys win and make a lot of money doing it, and they have. Uh, in, in any catalyst of a downturn, those guys are out of business. Um, and we think that a lot of those people that already had pain, um, when I say out of business, out of that deal, um, their equity is worth zero. Their equity is probably already worth zero. And now it's moving up the trough in the capital stack where the pref equity is whole, wholly or, or, or partially impaired and then the mez, and then you get to the senior loan. And, and we've, we've done very well buying great senior loans at par, um, where there's a tremendous amount of equity left in the deal. We've also bought you know, dozens and dozens of senior loans that were highly levered at significant discounts to get back to reality. Yeah, so I was actually gonna ask you what this, your strategy is. Where are you trying to enter the capital stack? Are you only coming in at the senior loan level or are you coming in at MES and PREF and other levels, PREF equity, other levels of the capital stack? Sure, so, so, so the mandate, our mandate, and where we've uh, historically over the past you know, 10 or 11 years made great equity-like returns was in the safest part of the capital stack and the senior debt. Um, with that being said, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes that's in parity with um, buying the fulcrum piece, right? So, so back in 2010, we bought uh, the senior loan from HSBC on a building called Trump Hollywood down here in South Florida. Um, and we paid par for the senior loan. Um, and the Lehman Brothers had held the mezzanine loan for $55 million. Uh, we paid $5 million for that. And the reason for doing that was that was the fulcrum piece. That was really the control piece that enabled us to take over and restructure with Related, who was the sponsor at the time, um, to actually have a swift outcome uh, on that deal. And we were in and out of that deal in you know, a little over a year and a half um, from start to finish because of that versus not buying that fulcrum piece and just being in protracted litigation for a couple of years. So, so the answer is, Sometimes you will you'll acquire that fulcrum piece in conjunction with the senior loan. Sometimes if that senior loan can be restructured as part of your plan, then that fulcrum piece gets really interesting to buy uh, as a standalone. Fascinating. So what's actually then the hardest part of what you do? <laughs> you make it sound very easy, but I know it's not. So what is the hardest part? Is it tracking, tracing deals? Is it negotiating once, you're, once you've got something in front of you? Is it financing the, the, the equity from your side to, to capitalize these things? What's the hardest part of what you do? It, it, it's a great question. You know, in, in our history, and again, it's just worked out this way, um, we've never bought a market deal. Uh, so by the time a loan sale goes out to the world, we're, we're just not going to win that. Uh, whether because we're too prudent or too cheap or too dumb, I don't, I, I, don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know. But we've never been successful in buying a marketed deal. Um, you're playing in a beauty contest. You're playing against capital that maybe doesn't have the same objectives for returns that you do. Um, so we buy and large just stay away from that. Uh, we'll chase stuff before it gets there. Um, so the hardest part for us is, is making sure that we see the flow first. Because um, let's be honest, there's a lot of capital out there. There's a lot of smart people out there. Uh, and we think we're generally smart guys where we've been really successful um, in the past is speed of execution. Uh, meaning deals like Trump Hollywood or 125 Granite Street, we're competing against the biggest of the big. And we're you know, relatively small guys, comparatively speaking. Um, but we've competed with the likes of the Relateds and the Whitcoffs and the Madisons and the Silversteins of the world. They're all chasing the same deal. How did we win? We won by coming in and, excuse the phrase, but you know, putting our balls on the table uh, and saying, hey, we'll close this in a week. Uh, and, and that's how we won Trump Hollywood. That's how we won 125 Greenwich. Oh, but hang on, I have to interrupt you. There. I love that you do that. During the, uh, during the last downturn, I, I was brought into a bank and then eventually at Colony Capital. And, uh, and the bank, we were quarterly based. So I would meet people on Monday right, right. at the end of the quarter and say, this deal has to be done by Friday, period. Right. Right? Yeah. We, has to be done. Somebody is going to buy this on Friday, who is it? So how do you do that on deals the size that you have? 
or that you look at, how do you underwrite a deal in five to seven days, realistically? Sure. So, so there's, look, it, not to sound um, cavalier in any ways, because it's, it, it's anything, but it's, it's when you know, and part of it is your gut. My partner, Dan, is actually planning on writing a book at some point called Don't Trip Over Your Gut. Um, but when prices reach a level where you feel like you're stealing it with a mask and a gun, or that you're just buying something so far below replacement cost. Um, the one benefit that we have is we don't have multiple layers of committees or whatnot. Uh, it's, it's Daniel and myself and we say, okay, we go, we go and we SWAT team it. So, so the most recent example, again, 125 Granite Street, you know, I, I remember I was, I was overseas as was our general counsel at the time. And we were on the phone with the attorney for, um, for United Overseas Bank of Singapore. And he said, and it was a Thursday. And, um, and I remember it was about two in the morning, my time where I was. And he said, look, I have, I have seven loan sale agreements out to guys that you know who they are. Um, so you're kind of at the, at the bottom of the, of the pile. And I, and I said that his name was Joe. I said, Joe, um, this is where we shine. We know, we know that we want this. Um, uh, everyone's at the same price. We don't have committees to go through. I promise you by Sunday night, um, we'll be your kind of most favored nation. Uh, and between that Thursday night and that Sunday night, literally we had kind of bribed our way into the asset with our construction folks. We flew up a team from, from Florida to New York, um, including our construction guys, our fire consultants, our, our, our permit guys, um, and literally sweet talked our way into the building under the radar. Um, walk the entire building, diligence the entire loan file. And we came back to them on Sunday night with a signed loan sale agreement um, and a $10 million deposit that we said, we'll go hard right now upon signing. And we'll close on Friday. Uh, and no one else was ready, willing, or able to do that. Um, so we leapfrogged kind of from, from least favored to, to most favored uh, and came out of nowhere. And I think caught a, a lot of people by surprise there, just like we did uh, on prior deals like Trump Hollywood. And, and, and when, back to your point in, in, in the quarterly bank meetings, when, when there's a need for liquidity, the need comes quickly, right? So it's, hey, we need liquidity and we need it now, not 30, 60, 90 days from now. We need it now and that's reflective in the pricing. Uh, and, 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 and I learned that lesson on our first deal as a firm on Terra Beach side when we had a negotiated deal with Regions Bank at somewhere around 23, 24 million dollars, and they were going to provide some financing of about 50 percent, and they were getting caught up in, in paralysis by analysis on the financing for us and our capital partner, which was a 20 billion dollar fund, and, um, and 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 they came back to us and said, guys, you know, we just need to get this done. You know, is there an all cash price? And we said, yeah, you know, the all cash the all cash price is 17 and a half, and we'll push the button tomorrow. They said, fine, we'll take it. We need the money, we'll take it. Um, so, so when that need for liquidity comes, A, it comes fast, um, and B, one of, one of your other questions I know is going to be how long do we think this is? Uh, and we think that there's going to be a elongated period of distress, but historically, and again, we're kind of in unhistorical territory, but historically the quality goes first because that's where they can free up the most liquidity. Um, so when, when that comes, and we think that it's coming, uh, we still think it's a bit early. We're seeing some interesting opportunities right now. Uh, but when that comes, it's going to come fast and the quality is going to go first. We think that period of distress is going to go on for quite some time, just like in, in 07, 08. I mean, we were still buying distress paper up, up till the end of 2012, but the best stuff really went in 2009, 2010. Right, exactly. When it was the height of the market and the greatest amount of uncertainty about where this was going to go, right? Correct. And, and look, it's, there's, a balance, there's a balancing act because in, it requires patience and prudence because it's better to be late than early in buying distressed debt. Um, and there's a lot of guys, and we're seeing some of it today. We're kind of scratching our heads when we look at the public markets. Um, you know, in 2007, I remember guys saying, oh my God, I'm buying this paper at you know, 95 cents on the dollar, I'm stealing it. And that paper was later bought by us and guys like us at 
know, 50 cents on the dollar. Falling sword. Uh, that was the term that was used. Yeah, exactly. It exactly. at a bargain, but it was still on its way down. Exactly. So, so, so that falling knife, in our opinion, is yet to come. With that being said, we're seeing some interesting opportunities where there was good lenders, good loans on good real estate, where those lenders now need liquidity for other reasons, for margin calls on other loans that they may have written or just to shore up their balance sheets. Uh, and we're seeing some interesting yield plays or, or credit plays where, where we can get great double digit yields on our capital um, in buying into safety, um, regardless of where the knife falls, you know, kind of no brainer stuff. Um, but we're really just kind of, you know, spending a lot of time going back to the, how do you get to the deal flow and, and understanding who's got pain uh, and even talking to the, the the guys that hold the repo or the warehouse facilities on that, because there's going to be margin calls on the whole loan side this summer. Uh, and we think that there's going to be a lot of buying opportunities. Right. And this summer, primarily because they'll be hitting their 90 day default marks, right? Yeah, hey, look, you, you have to remember that, that in the CMBS bond world, you can look on the Bloomberg screen and it's in real time, but that's not how real estate actually works. And I'm always reminding people that, April 1st, which was what, you know, three and a half weeks ago, was the first period of collections during Corona, right? This is new. This is completely new. Exactly. Uh, and we were saying in the middle of March, hey, kind of ignore April collections because they're not going to be really indicative of how deep this crisis may be. Uh, and May and June are really going to be better telltale signs. So, you know, and again, on a micro level, on, on some of our multi-aware demographics are off the charts and household incomes are, are, are all, again, off the charts. We had 92% collections. Uh, but then on some of the, 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 the lower end multifamily stuff or the, the rent stabilizer rent control, you know, that number was significantly less. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. And, and real estate is like turning a cruise ship where, you know, especially the stuff that's in CMBS, you don't pay for 30 days. They send you a little nice reminder. You got 60 or 90 days, they send it to the special servicer then they onboard it and they're going to order their valuations. And at that point, you know, the, the, the special servicers or the repo guys are going to say, Hey, we need updated values. Uh, and, and getting updated values today is a tricky thing because no one knows how to value anything right now uh, in terms of appraising assets, because there still isn't clarity on the medical crisis side. Uh, and until that happens, I think that it's going to be, um, a tumultuous time to try and you know, pick and choose your spots um, without that clarity. And again, we think that that's probably late summer or, or, or even beyond. Greg, crystal ball, where do you think the biggest opportunities are gonna, uh, gonna emerge? So the, the low hanging fruit that everyone's talking about is, is obviously hospitality and retail. Um, retail was already suffering before this. Uh, so we as a firm, you know, have a, a strong conviction that the retail landscape is going to be forever and let's classify forever as kind of the next decade um, change. We think it's going to look a lot different than it did 60 or 90 days ago. Um, so retail for sure, again, was already enduring pain to begin with. Um, hospitality, hotels were doing well 2018, 2019. Uh, 2020 was expected to be a generally flat year. Um, they got crushed and they're, they're going to continue to get crushed because they sell by the day. You know, they don't have a 10 year credit tenant. They, they're selling by the day. Um, and there's going to be a lot of pain there and that's going to take time to get back. There's not this V shaped you know, recovery snap in hospitality in our opinion, again, on, on a macro level, on a micro level, certain hotels are going to do better than others in terms of, you know, resorts because people will be, you know, wanting to get out of the house. Um, maybe drive to destinations will do better than they did historically because people don't want to travel or people aren't going on cruise ships necessarily. Um, so hospitality is going to endure a lot of pain in our opinion. Um, but we think that, that, the pandemic and the, the impact of the pandemic on commercial real estate is, is generally asset class agnostic, uh, with the exception of, you know, last mile you know, distribution for guys like Amazon and stuff like that. It, it's going to impact everyone just to certain degrees. You know, we, we don't know what, you know, office space requirements are going to look like for companies. And, and there's actually good arguments to have on both sides, which is there's the, hey, a bunch of our people could actually work from home. Um, so we need less. 
Um, and the counter argument to that is, well, actually, if you're going to have office space, um, you need more of it because you got to space people out. They can't. You be on need top more of per each person, other. exactly. Yeah, that's this this whole thing about communal and everyone being on top of each other um, is going to look very different on the back end of this thing. So, um, you know, office is going to see some changes, and we're going to adapt. We're an adaptive society, um, and multifamily is historically the safest asset class. We believe it still will be the safest asset class. Um, but there was a lot of froth in that space where, where it had become heavily commoditized mm -hmm. uh, and people were building or buying to return on cost margins that just we didn't find compelling. Um, and it doesn't take much. It takes a blip on the radar, not even a pandemic, um, to basically you know, eviscerate a lot of equity from that stuff. If there's you know, a 50 or 75 basis point movement in cap rate, and you know, there's no rent growth or there's, there's, there's rent contraction by, by 10%, the equity is worth zero. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you, you definitely understate the, uh, the pressures on the under, uh, under, underwritten multifamily right? yeah. deals that have gone out there over the last 10 years for sure. So yeah, look at an interesting opportunity. But so how do you guys look at deals then? If, you, if there's so much doubt, and this is the same thing we were talking about during the last downturn early on, there was this danger, this fear that the entire financial system would collapse. Right. The guys that were buying at that time, yeah, they were buying, you know, falling swords, but they were also taking on a uh, tremendous risk that this thing would never pull out. And I'm hearing kind of two sides to that from you also, that we just don't know how some of these asset classes are going to, are going to roll out in time. So when you look at a specific deal, what makes it a steal? Is it that it is cash perform? You can make it, you can justify it because of what it's putting out in terms of returns today. So right. it can't get worse, right? It's going to get better. It can only get better. Or you're looking at it from a, well, we think in a year's time, we'll be able to do this to it or that to it, or somebody else will, and we'll resell the paper. No. So, so I will tell you that, that, First and foremost, we're not seeing the opportunity today to steal anything yet. That hasn't come. Um, it is coming, uh, whether that's 60 days away or 180 days away, TBD. Um, but the opportunity to, to feel gutturally that we're buying stuff super cheap um, has not occurred yet. The first wave is, you know, hey, we're selling this loan, it's a good yield, or we'll sell you a piece of this loan and give you a better yield. Um, so most of the opportunities that we're seeing today are through the creditor structure um, where guys within that stack need liquidity and they're willing to pay um, an attractive yield to do it. And the last dollar of exposure there is, you know, call it at you know, 30 to 50 percent of what we perceive to be new value. Um, but you reach a point where, where you're looking at this and... We're, we're looking at a deal right now that we're going to buy where the senior loans last dollar exposure on a new multifamily deal in Queens, you know, fully occupied basically. Um, last dollar of loan exposure is like $225 a foot. Um, I, if we're ever wrong there, right? If we're ever wrong at that basis, there's a lot bigger problems in the world, right? Meaning if, <laughs> exactly. if, if the world has reached a point where, where that basis is impaired, um, the world's over, meaning the Armageddon scenario has, has kind of happened. Um, we're new construction in New York City um, at $225 a foot is, is impaired. So, so we're, we're investing very um, strategically. We're not investing a lot right now, I'll tell you that much. We've looked at probably 100 deals in the past three or four weeks. Uh, there's only two that excite us. Um, so we're up, we're investing from kind of a fear-based mentality today, kind of saying, A, things are going to get worse and we need to stress test that. And B, on the back end of this thing, we do not believe that, that underwriting standards, um, on a buy or a sale are going to look the way they look 60 days ago. Um, generally think that cap rates are going to hold steady because cost of capital has gone down, um, with some deviation to that. Um, but from a, from an underwriting standpoint, in terms of income and expenses, I think that's going to look really different in terms of vacancy and loss collection, in terms of expense growth, in terms of no rent growth or, or some rent contraction, in terms of reserves, 
Um, you know, every deal was being kind of looked at the same, oh, 5% occupancy and a 5% cap rate on an exit. Um, you know, that, that will always stand the test of time. That's not accurate today. Um, so I think that, that where, you know, if, if NOI was going to be a million dollars under old underwriting standards at a five cap, puts it at a $20 million valuation, I think that the five cap will probably hold, but it'll be underwritten based on $900,000 of NOI or $800,000 of NOI versus that million bucks. What kind of, what size of deals do you guys look at, Gregory? So, you know, we, we've done, we kind of bracket our business into, into two segments and, and the stuff that gets the headlines is the sexy stuff. You know, it's the, the Trump Hollywood is the 125 Greenwiches of the world. Um, and those deals come along here or there. You can't really build an investment model or philosophy around doing that of, uh, in a programmatic way where you can continue to buy a lot of that, uh, unless you're a Blackstone or something like that, where you can only write $200 million checks. Um, we've, we've done very, very well playing in the space that's kind of um, too big for the mom and pops and too small for the institutional guys. Um, so call it that you know, 15 to $50 million space. Um, we think there's a lot of opportunity there. We're focused on big opportunities and, and we want to deploy a lot of capital at the right time. Um, so we're right now we're looking at the two deals we're looking at. One's $11 million, one's $220 million. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Hopefully both selling for the same uh, nominal dollar amount, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and look, it, it goes back to the, the question we get asked a lot, you know, by, by folks that aren't that familiar with, with the distressed debt investment space is, oh, well, you know, what are you looking to pay for loans? And, and the answer, which is the right answer is, is that the price that you pay for the loan is purely indicative of, of how much equity is left. And, and again, if that loan's a good loan, par is the number. We've made hundreds of millions of dollars um, for our capital partners and, and, and investors buying loans at par, good loans at par, Granite Shoe is at par, Trump Valley was at par to name a few. Um, we've also bought dozens and dozens of loans at pennies on the dollar. Uh, again, it's relative to that equity that's left, number one. And number two, it's relative to the quality of that paper. Um, and that's something that's often overlooked by a lot of folks that, that don't have the benefit of having been through complex litigation and seeing um, every argument that can be thrown at you by a borrower or their, or their counsel. Um, so the quality of the paper, <clears throat> separate and apart from the default rate on that paper, the quality of that paper um, can be fatal to, to folks that don't know what they're getting into. Uh, so it all factors into how, how you're buying. All right, so let's uh, move to wrapping up because I know you're very, very busy. Uh, so how do you guys finance your fund? By the way, this, this, this is the highlight of my day. You know, I, I, I got dressed for this. Uh, I, actually get, I actually get to have social interaction. Uh, this is, this is oh, great. Greg, I'm so happy you say that because honestly, I'm, I'm enjoying talking to you very much indeed. I would actually quite like to talk for a lot longer, but I just want to be respectful of your time. Well, this okay. to me is super exciting times. Look, you know, we, we were talking about the difference between now and then. And the then is, of course, the 2008 downturn. And now it's, it's a terrible thing because there's a health consequence to people really suffering. It's a terrible environment and we're all personally fearful of that right i mean we it's it reaches into all of us and it's affected all of our lives on the other hand during the last downturn there was a similarity and that similarity was looking back on it that people were being kicked out of their homes there was a human aspect to it 12 years ago also so it's but the, but the but uh bringing capital back into the market to help uh, re, you know, refinance some of these deals is, is what's so exciting to me right now. So here, let me ask you this question. How do you finance your fund? So you talked about having a distressed debt fund. So how do you capitalize that? What's your structure so that when you're in at a bank, you know you've got the money to be able to close on Friday? What is sure. it? So, so, so before I, I respond to that, going back to, to the... The, the comparison to 2008 on, on a human level, you're a thousand percent accurate, but it was, it was also isolated because of the credit crisis that was predominantly derived from the residential mortgage space, right? Um, but while that was happening, 
people were still operating. They were still traveling. They were still going to restaurants. They were still, society as a whole was, was still operating, right? And, and, and the difference here, and it's, look, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, my partner Dan and I speak about this often. I don't know of another time in recent history where the whole world, forget about your political affiliation or your religious affiliation, the whole world is focused on the same issue. And that's, that's powerful. And I, and I think that, that it's, it's great for, for unity and kind of you know, recognizing what's actually important in the world. But, but it's the only time, comparing it to 2008, where everything stopped, right? It, no one underwrote a zero, right? People underwrote, oh, well, the hotel may be off in occupancy or seasonality, or we may not lease up apartments at the same pace. No one underwrote a hard stop or a zero. And that's, that's something that, that is, is new for everyone. So, so, so yes, on a human level, um, it's also very different this time around because people are dying in mass. And, and, and while there was a lot of pain felt by a lot of people during the credit crisis, it wasn't causing their death or their demise, right? They, 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 would, they would lose their homes. And we never invested in, in the residential space or the primary single family home space because it was very recent. There's a distinct difference between foreclosing on or, or recapturing a property from a sophisticated landlord or office owner or developer versus kicking someone out of their home. That's, that's, a, that's a very different business and requires um, a, a different mentality and approach. Uh, and it's something that we have zero interest in participating in just from a, a moral standard uh, standpoint. So, so there, is, there is a distinct difference between now and 2008. We think it's, it's, it's much worse, not only because of the death, um, but because of the lasting impacts that it's gonna have from this, because we're not just going back to normal. You know, they're talking about reopening certain things on, on Wednesday here in Florida and restaurants, a lot of restaurants are not going to come back or if they come back, they're going to fail because they can't survive at 25% or 50% occupancy. So, so it is different in that respect across all asset classes. Uh, in terms of how, how we're positioned and, and ready to pounce, um, the whole thesis when we set up this fund in the end of 2018 and again, we were, we were early. We, you know, we set it up in November of 2018. I don't know if you remember or not, but in December, there was a lot of volatility in the market. Rates were going up. And we were kind of saying, oh, my God, we're geniuses. You know, we set this up at, at the perfect time, and, and, and let's, let's get ready to pounce. Um, and then, of course, that, that reverted, and rates, rates went down, and the bull market continued. Uh, again, despite that, we were able to buy um, one, one not performing one of size. Um, so we were, we, were, we were early in terms of, of our strategy, um, but the time is certainly now. But that strategy was, was derived on our, our historical execution of, hey, the way we win is being ready to react very quickly. And in order to react quickly, you need to have the capital to do that. Um, and we did very well during the last downturn. And, that, and we were starting the firm. We don't come from you know, generational wealth or money. Our dads weren't in real estate. We built the firm, you know, with a dollar and a stick of gum. And, <laughs> and, 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 and we didn't have the access to capital back then that we had today. We didn't have the track record then that we have today. Um, so the, the whole structure was built around that and leveraging that to be in a position to pounce. By the same token, we're not interested in being just fund managers that have to deploy capital because in our business, you never want to be forced to deploy capital just for the sake of keeping the machine running and churning fees. So we came up with a structure that's almost like a quasi GP fund where we said, Hey guys, you know, this is what we've done. You've been with us before. Here's our thesis of, 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 of who it's going to come from and when, um, and, and we want to create a vehicle where, where we have the ability to, to call capital literally on a couple days notice. Um, to take down opportunities. And, and, and that initial structure was sized as a GP fund with $100 million of capacity. And everyone that's invested in that fund is, is also there for, for the ability to co-invest on the bigger opportunities. So everyone that's in that fund, they, you know, whatever the dollars they committed for, uh, we wouldn't take people into that fund unless they were, they were bullish on the thesis and able to write checks you know, five to 10 times the size of their um, initial commitment to the GP fund 
uh, where they okay, get- so actually, so let me ask you this then. So what are those numbers then? So to come into the GP fund, what's your minimum? The and minimum then- the minimum on the fund to come into the GP fund, like most funds, is a million dollars. Uh, and again, we're we're looking for long term partners, many of which are existing partners that have been in deals with us for for the greater part of a decade, and also new new partners as well. Um, but guys that under guys and gals that understand our thesis and believe in the thesis and agree that hey, the time to pounce is not yet, but when it comes, it's going to come quickly, and we got to be ready to do it. And that's that's really what that structure is set up to do. So, um, you know, we we feel great that we that we have the ability to tap you know up to a billion dollars of capital to deploy when the time is actually right, in our opinion. Uh, let me just understand that, if you don't mind, because it's a structure I'm not familiar with or not seen before. So you have a GP fund. Uh, and what is the function of that entity relative to the opportunities that are coming down the pipe that you say, join the GP fund or invest in the GP fund and be ready to write checks for 10 times that when we find deals? In other words, high octane. So what's so the, it, it, what's it, the it, value it, proposition at the GP level? I understand it once you're buying loans, but what is it at the GP level? Sure. So, so the, 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 the value proposition is that, and the analogy we use a lot is, is that the, that fund vehicle, and it's a, we call it a GP fund, it's a quasi-GP fund. That vehicle is really the fishing vessel that's putting poles in the water. Right, um, and 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 that fund will buy whole loan positions or participations, um, and depending on the size of those loans, the fund may and will own 100% of those positions. Um, and on the bigger deals, when they come along, um, the fund the fund will take its pro rata share based on its concentration limits and that, that are mandated by the fund by asset class or geography or, or dollar size, and will then do a sidecar or a co invest that goes to all those fund investors first, right? So by way of example, the $11 million deal that we're buying, that goes in the fund, it stays in the fund. We, we may take some modest leverage there. That stays in the fund. There's no total investment that, that goes in there. On the $220 million deal, the fund will take its chunk uh, and in conjunction with no note financing and we'll, we'll, we'll do a co-invest to those fund investors. And everyone, everyone that's in the fund is really excited about the co-investment opportunities because it also provides them the ability to be selective, right? And in an example that is 125 Greenwich Street, the co-investment there was like $23 million. Um, one guy took 20 million of that. And his commitment in the fund is nowhere near $20 million, right? So 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 that's that's really the value proposition, which is which is it's 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 the entree to, to the real distress. Um, it makes monthly distributions when there's, when there's realizations, whether that's from some of the performing loans or non-performing loans that are in there. Uh, and it's callable capital, so we're not looking to charge fees uh, on money that isn't actually deployed. That's really interesting structure. So how long do you think this opportunity is gonna last? I mean, uh, we've, we, we under, I understand, and you and I think definitely the same, it's not going to really emerge until June, I think, uh, and into the summer before the opportunities start to really flesh out. But how long do you think it's going to last, uh, Greg, just to kind of move towards wrapping up as much as I would like to stay on the call with you? Realistically. You know, it's, it, it, if I had a crystal ball, we'd be a lot more successful than, than we have been. <laughs> cool. um, I. I generally think that our, our belief as a firm is that there's going to be opportunities for a couple of years um, in the world of distressed debt. Again, we think that the initial wave will be very interesting and exciting when pricing gets to the level that we think it needs to be at uh, for it to be really compelling to deploy a lot of capital. Um, so I think that there's going to be uh, that first window is going to be the most exciting window for quality, and our, our our investment thesis and strategy is is quality. Don't go to look at buying, you know, what looks good on paper uh, in a tertiary market, you know, in the secondary city or, or whatever the case may be. The the Hampton and off the turnpike. Focus on quality, urban core, 
um, because when there is going to be a snapback or recovery, and there will be, there's, there's absolute confidence um, that we have that we recover from this. We just think it's a, a bit longer than some of the more people that are more optimistic than we are out there. Um, but the quality recovers first, right? That's what we've seen from prior, from prior doctrine. So the focus on quality, we think the window, the buy quality will, will be part of the first wave of, of real distress buying. Um, and then that will continue on for some time where there will still be opportunities, um, some of which may, may, may still be exciting, but by the time it works to the kind of the second, third or fourth um, round, it's kind of the dreck that's left, uh, which is what we saw in the last downturn as well. It was you know, the stuff that never traded off the books was the small balance you know, loan that was collateralized by an auto repair shop you know, or, or, or a gas station. Uh, so we think, we think that that's coming this year in, in 2020. Uh, and we think it's going to last for, for a while. And, and some of the distress that we think will exist today will not actually make itself visible for a longer period of time, right? Uh, again, that office, that office deal and that CMBS will may perform great um, as people return to work, but then all those lease maturities that they banked on extending next year or in 2022 fall off a cliff, there's kind of that second wave of, of, of distress that, that is likely to come. So it's going to be interesting. I'll tell you what, let's wrap it up there. I've got one last question for you. I'm going to ask it offline. But Greg Friedman, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. For your you time made, with me. It was an you made, you made my day. Uh, in terms of uh, social interaction, this is, this, is, this is the best of the day. That was Gregory Friedman, co-founder at BH3. Be sure to go to the podcast page for this episode at gowcrowd.com to access all the resources I've put together for you there. There's a lot there from free training, syndication best practices, discounts off our flagship investor acquisition system online master course, and be sure to check out the short highlight videos on that page as well for a quick look at some of the most important concepts and ideas that you need to know about if you want to make money from distressed debt during this downturn. Bunch of short videos, all featuring Gregory Friedman. Check it out there, all on the podcast page at gowercrowd.com. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Gregory Friedman of BH3 for your time with me today. That's all for this episode. I'll see you next time. And in the meantime, stay well. And for now, this is Dr. Adam Gower signing off. Music